Good afternoon, everyone. This is Chaitali Bhatt from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe based out of Cyprus. In a run up to India's Republic Day, Aviation and Defense Universe is brainstorming the maritime challenges faced by the nation and the solutions given by Indian Navy. And our guests for the day are two very popular naval analysts, Commodore Ranjit B. Rai and Commodore Aja Singh who will bring forth the A to Z of the safety and security of our seas, both militarily and geopolitically. We have with us Sangeeta Saxena, Editor, Aviation and Defense Universe, to take the discussion forward. Welcome, sirs. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you very much, Atali. And most welcome, Commodore Ranjit Rai and Commodore Raj Singh. As always, it's wonderful to have you both here on the chat show with us. And uh, basically today, you know, we are doing a run up to the Republic Day, which is a day or two ahead. And what we are going to do is that we would like to understand from you experts, what are the challenges the country is facing? How does the Navy plan to, you know, meet these challenges? And how does the Navy plan to, you know, get us onto an international platform, which we already are in? But then, of course, we do want to, you know, be, uh, be a part of the larger scenario. And uh, beginning the discussion with the expertise both of you have, I have taken the call that the senior gets the first question, sir. So we, our first question is to Commodore Ranjit Rai. Sir, thank you very much for coming to ADU. And my first question to you is, sir, that what are the challenges according to you at the moment? It's always a pleasure to be with a professional channel, uh, you know, ADU. Now, to tell you about the challenges, let's quickly sum up the history. The Second World War, the Navy went from 8,000 to 48,000. Lord Mountbatten and the whole world applauded what the Indian Navy managed to do. But it was obliterated from the Royal Navy's history for not giving us the credit. But the Indian Navy did put it down in a book. Now, that legacy was left with those Royal Navy trained. Then our officers went and brought 16 ships from England. They stood by how to make ships. So when they came back, they said, we will have to be a builder's Navy. So we were lucky. The base was tremendous. The other services always bought equipment from abroad. Air Force mainly and continues a large today. Therefore, the challenge that we had was to guard the Indian coastline, 6,500 kilometers, the islands of Andamans, the islands of Lakshwati, and the huge 2.8 million square kilometers of the huge Indian Ocean. We were carrying on. The size of the Navy is very small, 70,000, much less than in four seas of the Delhi police. And till 2014, with waxing and waning budgets, we were increasing our numbers. We were increasing our numbers. And then came the object 2027. We should have 200 ships and 400 aircraft, which the Navy needed. Because by now, China made friendship with Pakistan on a maritime front. Was getting Djibouti as a base, which they now built up huge. Therefore, the challenge for the Indian Navy today is to make sure that the Indian Ocean region, where we are the predominant Navy, a service provider for the maritime part for the literals who love our democracy, keep away China from actually pushing its way into the Indian Ocean to get to the Atlantic to take on the United States of America. So that is the basic challenge. And the Indian Navy is one of the few services lucky. We do not have like the Army, the Air Force, or the, have multiple agencies looking after the seas. We don't have ITBP, BSF, SSF, everybody. Miles of territory they look after and report to the Home Ministry. We have the Coast Guard and the Indian Navy reporting to the Ministry of Defense. So as Chaitali said, geopolitically, we are lucky. We are under one ministry. They think alike. And in wartime, we have put it down. The Coast Guard comes into the Navy. So the challenge becomes a little more that we must have ships. We must have aircraft, we must have submarines, and we must have what Navy believes, technology. So from Doklam, our budget went down from 20% of the defense budget to 14%. 
but the navy was quick and in the last few years changed this target to 167 ships and 200 aircraft or 300 aircraft so budget wise we did and in the last 3 years i'll end by telling you the challenge of technology the indian navy had an organization called vesi today if you're an officer in vesi you want to go to info seas you can write to them they i want one week with you they learn from us and we learn from them you will go on temporary duty to vesi you can go to a company and look at their equipment so we just ordered equipment from ultra mahindra because we saw they were looking after the pai radars so we going to get radars from united states through mahindra ultra is giving us ultra india through mahindra is going to give us submarine uh, anti submarine equipment so the challenge now is which is the last thing i'll try to explain if you do not look after your land or water territory somebody else will come and occupy it south china sea crimea ladakh dokla so indian navy has this challenge that we continue to remain rather strong and fearful in the indian ocean region with a malacca dilemma and the andaman dilemma for the navy to work out a strategy for war so that is the challenge of the navy it's looked at every day every morning ships are going round the world exercising with every friendly navy in the world to make sure that our challenge does not become alone india's maritime challenge that was wonderful sir and a great start to the chat now i go to the next speaker and who's a submariner and you know whenever we have him with us we always want to know what are the challenges below the surface of the seas so commodore aj most welcome to the chat show and we'll ask you the same question again what are the challenges below the surface of the sea uh, thank you very much sangeeta and chetali for having me on the show and you know it's always a honor and a privilege to be with commodore ranjit rai with his wealth of experience we are sort of uh, learning from him all the time from his enthusiasm and his knowledge both and i wish by the time we reach where he is we are i have also you know sort of reached some sort of similar level of uh, understanding and knowledge anyway coming to the underwater dimension now commodore rai has given a fantastic overview of the overall overall maritime security challenge that india faces and the importance of the indian navy retaining its primacy in the indian ocean from a underwater perspective from an undersea warfare perspective this is going to be an increasingly important uh, element in the whole great power rivalry which is going to be played out in the indian ocean over the next two decades or so uh with with the improvements in you know maritime surveillance with very good aircraft doing long tail long range maritime patrol space cyber and all getting a look in uh the surface of the sea has become quite transparent so large naval forces will be constrained in their ability to operate above the surface of the sea without being detected or tracked therefore it will largely remain on the undersea domain to rest that sort of offensive advantage which navies would be looking for in this region now as far as the indian navy is concerned nobody has ever questioned of our primacy in the indian ocean has never been challenged ever since independence and the navy has grown subsequently into a very balanced uh, multi-dimensional uh, blue water force and when i say multi-dimensional i also include the undersea warfare dimension because the undersea warfare dimension is not only about submarines it's again a multi multi-dimensional aspect you have to carry out undersea warfare from the air from the surface and from below the surface and of course with space and cyber coming in that becomes an element too in a network uh, maritime battle space environment India has a fairly potent undersea warfare capability but unfortunately there are capability gaps which have arisen over the years these have never been seriously challenged because we've never had a competitive undersea warfare environment from any of our our so called threats that is likely to change in the next will by the end of this decade i'm not even saying the next decade by the end of this decade you know china remains our biggest threat in the indian ocean now china is seeking to achieve global supremacy or global superpower uh, uh, dominance via the maritime route that means maritime domain domination is intrinsic to china's long long term strategy this maritime geography has been unfavorable to china you know there were too many narrow straits and islands and all to be able to dom start dominating from there so they are fairly restricted and constrained in their ability to operate in the 
Western Pacific. So they will need a much wider oceanic space to sort of project their power and to bid for great power rivalry, to, for, to bid for supremacy in the great power rivalry. So that is more likely to be played out in the Indian Ocean than in the uh, Pacific part of the Indo-Pacific. And the Indian Ocean is also China's gateway to the Atlantic Ocean. And that is where China ultimately wants to be. They already have an Atlantic strategy in place because they feel that unless they're able to dominate the Atlantic, they really are not going to have that kind of global domination that they're seeking. Now, the undersea warfare dimension, if you see, I'm coming down now to actually the, the, the really the nitty gritty of it all. China has, at, has simultaneously, besides building its Navy at a, at a breathtakingly rapid pace, including its submarines, also been trying to create a logistic and base support arrangement within the Indian Ocean. So that by the time their Navy has reached that level where they can project power in the Indian Ocean, they have adequate basing and logistic support facilities to be able to support that power projection. So at the moment, China is not only building its submarine capability within, it is it is it has said it will double its nuclear submarine fleet by 2030. Even if it doesn't double, it will definitely achieve at least 175% of what it is today. They already have six SSBNs, they have six SSNs, they have a, a conventional force of almost 50 submarines. And 50 fairly modern submarines. They've got the kilos, they've got the modified kilos, and they've got their own type 039 submarines. But what is more alarming for India is the fact that they are providing submarines to, they've given two submarines to Bangladesh, two Ming class submarines in 2017. On 21st December 2021, they gave a Ming class submarine to Myanmar. Now, the Ming class submarine by itself does not pose a threat to the Indian Navy. They're old submarines, they don't have much capability. And the Chinese know that. It is not meant to be a threat to the Indian Navy. It is meant to provide China the ability to operate their submarines in the Bay of Bengal and have logistic and support facilities for their submarines when they decide to operate in the Bay of Bengal. In Bangladesh, they're setting up a submarine base called BNS Sheikh Hasina of Cox's Bazaar. Once they set up that submarine base, it, which is ostensibly meant to support the Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh Navy submarines, but they will have Chinese expertise. They will have Chinese spares. They will have the Chinese wherewithal to support their own submarines, which will be operating in the Indian Ocean. One of the constraints for China to operate in the Indian Ocean is the fact that the Indian Ocean from their mainland is far away. They have to come through choke points. The only way they can circum, if they circumvent these choke points, they have to traverse a much longer distance below the choke points, the Lombok, Sunda or the Malacca Straits, which means that their SSKs, their diesel electric submarines are constrained in their ability to, op ability to operate in the Indian Ocean, not so much their SSNs. But once they have basing and support facilities in the Indian Ocean, this, this uh, limitation is considerably re reduced. Then they can bring a submarine here and permanently operate it from the Indian Ocean for six months, one year, two years, whatever they choose to do. So, so on the one hand, our maritime superiority in the, in the Bay of Bengal will get compromised. Our maritime interest in the Bay of Bengal will get compromised. Now we come to the West. In the West, they are arming Gwadar. They're, they're, building, they're building four Type 039 submarines for Pakistan uh, in China and four in Pakistan, which means they're giving Pakistan the ability to be able to support, maintain, refit and build submarines, which ultimately benefits China because China tomorrow will be able to position its submarines in Karachi or Gwadar and we get full logistics and, and uh, shore support for those submarines to operate. So I think this is something that India really needs to worry about. Why is China giving Pakistan eight submarines? Why does Pakistan need 11 submarines for a coastline which is barely three to 500 kilometers, the Makran coast? Obviously, there is more to it from a strategic perspective than just containing India, than, than just Pakistan containing India. It's about China containing India in the Indian Ocean and using Pakistan for the purpose. If they can keep India engaged, if or get Pakistan to keep India engaged in the North Arabian Sea, they have a free run in the, in the Indian Ocean which is where ultimately the way they're building the Navy, if they have four aircraft carriers by 2030, they will have a carrier battle group position in Djibouti or wherever they choose to do it. But there will be one carrier battle group permanently deployed in the Indian Ocean. For India, uh, we have to strengthen our undersea warfare capability across all, all domains. We have to have very good surveillance from the air. We've got to have good maritime uh, ASW from, from helicopters. We, our surface ships have to be well armed. Uh, our submarines have to be able to detect and uh, prosecute Chinese submarines. We should be able to have unmanned underwater vehicles which can patrol things like choke points and keep keep tabs on, on the movement of Chinese submarines. So we need to have a very comprehensive undersea warfare effort. At the moment, I'm not sure uh, we have been able to sort of put our act together in terms of we know what we want to do. 
but we are not being able to do it fast enough for whatever the reasons be uh you are aware that you know during the last commanders conference in october or november 2021 the defense minister had unveiled an unmanned road map for the indian navy which includes unmanned underwater vehicles so obviously the indian navy knows exactly what is required over a time frame we probably would get some sort of budgetary support when the threat starts looming much larger on our sort of horizon we are waiting now for the unmanned version of the unmanned of the unmanned road map to come the unclassified version so that industry knows what it has to do in the next 5 10 15 years to be able to meet the navy's requirements so i think we have to put in a lot of focused effort on developing our undersea warfare capability to counter the challenge that we're going to face across the length and breadth of the indian ocean and to our own maritime interests in the region from an undersea warfare perspective absolutely so that was so nicely explained i'm sure the audience will be very happy to listen to all this because these things are some things which we very rarely listen, you know hear of and understand so continuing from commodore aj to commodore ranjit rai i sir we would like to understand from you what uh, is the status quo you know we know what is the status quo of the aircraft carrier but how do we make ourselves sufficient and uh, what how much time will it take for the for the indian navy to be sufficient in this uh, you know uh, fact that we do not have aircraft carrier with us and uh, one functional doesn't make sense well uh, i'll continue from where aj told you but he warned you very heavily that of course the undersea warfare capability of china but i think i'll give you good news also the surface capability of the indian navy mm -hmm. is likely to rise exponentially in the next few years i list the ships that we are making a three type 15 bravo vishakhapatnam type brahmos barak and they will be getting the sikorsky helicopter the latest weaponized missile borne sonar helicopter they look after the submarines of course i must also add there will be seven shivaliks coming up seven shivalik wonderful ship barak and brahmos and you know brahmos is going to be exported the garpoon b has been changed atman nirbhar in india i did not realize when initially prime minister talked about atman atmanur but there it is the garpoon b radar which finds the target for the brahmos is today a terma tata or tata terma so many things are happening uh, we are going to get uh, uh, four crevax two from russia two from boer shipyard we are going to get uh, four service ships moving pretty fast because we are not a rich man navy we are a well i wouldn't say poor man we are a middle class navy economically we are going to get more nuclear submarines i believe one is ready for commissioning one has been launched it's all on the uh, google map you can see it so therefore we have to conserve, conserve and then we got the pai 12 pai when we going more they are anti submarine ships china submarine will have to be careful about it it is told you the picture yes so it's not so alarming as people are saying not because of any government tremendous support it is the navy's initial self help that is done there are five opvs lying in reliance there's a court case going on i mean there are five platforms to be weaponized we need opvs so first thing i would like to say that yes there is good news around the corner and as aj singh said if all the headaches which are other services are going through and threats reduced in their navy's budget we looking forward to the uh, budget session then we can write more about this particular subject and about the aircraft carrier mai har dafa samjhata hu is it robin hood or is it bahu bali <laughs> robin hood means paise wale aadmi se garib ko paisa do give from the rich so air force and army may lose a little of their budget but it will be over years so robin hood but it is bahu bali if you have the power of the aircraft carrier humanitarian support with the nuclear submarines with ship screening and with the forward carrier task force mig 29s in the air PAI and support from a air sea strategy with the air force our air force is a very very capable air force our army has shown it that it is a very very careful and powerful army to take on and i am a great believer 
China hasn't got an inch of extra space. They've got our patrolling rights covered. And that is what has been going on even with ADU when I heard uh, lovely uh, generals talking about it. We have to get our patrolling points back. But for the time being, we are doing a reasonable job of what is happening. Yes, therefore, another thing, of course, uh, AJ explained Pakistan very well. They actually started building a 039 submarine in uh, Karachi last month. They cut the steel for it. So if they are going to be helped fully, I don't think China is now so serious to go all out. But on maritime, they will take border. They will make border and Ormara, a naval base with PNS Jinnah is coming up. They've got Djibouti. And finally, I'd like to say, because AJ said it very well, we after Limoa, we have logistic sort agreements with different names with Australia. We have it with Japan. We have it with Vietnam. We had it with Korea. And I believe we had sorry, signed it with France. Maybe Germany, the chief of naval staff was here. So therefore, the logistic support of like-minded navies who can give you intelligence. Because I am a believer, having worked in that organization for Oppawan, it is the key. If you can be warned earlier, the Indian Navy knows how to deal with the factor. So on a good note, I would only like to say that, yes, the Indian Navy's challenges are much bigger. But luckily, with Coast Guard and one organization, if they're Leadership is outstanding. Today, only promotees are those who did well at sea. I come from the generation where naval headquarters, file work was important. But when you put them in higher jobs, where you had ships to command, aircraft, and these submarines with AJ Singh is explaining to you, you had to have salt in your veins. But today, I can see, it is rather uh, fortunate that if you have done very well at sea, you will rise. If you're a staff officer, Yes, you will rise, but those operational fighting jobs have to be done by fighting men. So on a happy note, I would like to say the challenges are there, but the Navy, the way it is doing, and I'm an outsider, can watch it every day. It's around the world. And now Milan, friendship with 45 nations. COVID is there, but those 45 nations will be careful. Then comes the free tribute. COVID or no free tribute. The president has to be given a free review during his tenure. So I have tried to say that, yes, AJ has told you, underwater, yes, we still need torpedoes for the discovery. There are challenges. There are challenges. But the Navy takes it step by step and analyzes it. Uh, thank you, sir. But that is really nice. And uh, I, I really hope, you know, that all that uh, both of you were saying here, you know, uh, satisfies the audience because we always get this feeling that you know the the budget which is given to the navy is much less. So you know that is the concern. Uh, continuing from here, uh, sir, I to Commodore AJ. Uh, Commodore AJ just wanted to understand from you that uh, you know uh, Ranjit sir just spoke about Atmanirbhar Bharat. Now in the navy. How much do you feel? Navy has always been a step ahead, you know. So uh, we, we've seen everything being made in the Indian shipyards. But in addition to that, whatever is, you know, you have a platform which is being made, yes, but there are many other requirements. So is Atmanirbhar Bharat and Make in India sufficient? Or uh, you still need to have heavy, uh, you know, imports and only then you are able to satisfy the urge of being perfect? Uh Firstly, Atmanirbhar Bharat may have, may, become, may have become a buzzword in India in the last two years. It's been a buzzword in the Navy since the early 1960s. Ever since INS Ajay was the first Indian warship, Indian built warship commissioned into the Indian Navy. And I think despite all the sort of uncertainties, despite all the uh, challenges, the Navy stuck to becoming a builder Navy because it very early it realized that if it has, if the Indian Navy has to be the primary naval power and if India has to really be the primary Indian Ocean power, we cannot be dependent on imports because that is a major strategic vulnerability. So as chiefs of naval staff have repeatedly emphasized over the years at their press conferences and other fora, today the Indian Navy's 39 or 40 ships that are in, under construction or on order are all being built in Indian shipyards. 
And similarly, I understand there are another 40 odd ships for which acceptance of necessity has been accorded, which are also going to be built in Indian shipyards. We are only one of six countries which has not only built an aircraft carrier indigenously, but also a ballistic missile nuclear submarine. Now, this is, these are two technologies that are absolutely at the upper end of, of cutting technology in any country. And particularly an aircraft carrier, which is extremely complex, and a ballistic missile nuclear submarine, which is supposed to be more complex than building a spaceship. Mm. So these are two major achievements which we have. And that means we have the technological expertise and the capability to do it. What we lack, perhaps, is the capacity. You know, INS, I wouldn't say INS because it's not commissioned yet, but the Vikrant, in its very first outing at sea, was able to achieve its maximum speed. It was able to maintain its sea keeping abilities. Now, this is unprecedented. Even countries which have been building aircraft carriers for years and years, when they first go out for, go out for a trial with their new carrier or a new design of carrier, are unable to achieve this. There are always some niggling problems, maybe with vibration in the shaft, or there may be a listing problem, because, and those are then slowly ironed out. But Vikrant, in its very first outing, was able to do full power trials, achieve maximum speed, and retain her, her, and was her perfect sea keeping abilities. So that is something that is really a, a testament to India's technological and shipbuilding skills. That apart, now where are the limitations? Our biggest limitation, in my view, is our lack of shipbuilding capacity. On the one hand, yes, we are constrained by budgets. The naval budget, which had gone up to almost 20%, as Commodore Rai mentioned a little while ago, fell back to 14%. And this has become a bit of a millstone around the Navy's neck because, firstly, there are two aspects to it. One is, of course, you get less money. So you're able to uh, spend less money on new, new programs. And secondly, we have the problem of committed liabilities in the Indian defense ecosystem, where you know, cascading effects of previous delays eat into the next year's budget. So, well, this has been highlighted to the government. Last year, the government did increase the naval budget by about, a, about 1% or so. And we're hoping that this trend will continue over the next few years because the maritime threat is becoming, is a very clear and present danger that is now looming in front of everybody. Uh, as far as coming back to shipbuilding capacity, now, it is for the government now to ensure and create an enabling environment to ensure that India is able to build as many ships as it wants to build. At the moment, even if we were wanting to build more, even if there was money to build more, the shipyards just don't have the capacity to build anymore. These 39 ships that are already on order with Indian shipyards are going to take at least 8 to 10 years to build. So where is the scope for more? That means you have to, you have to widen your shipbuilding capacity. You have to encourage the private sector to come in. What we have done so far is discourage the private sector from coming in. We've created such an intense competitive environment that they have buckled under their own weight and collapsed. We have just one private shipyard, and that is Larson and Tubro shipyard, which is in some sort of shipbuilding it's doing in the country. But otherwise, the complete effort, even today, is only with the five PSU shipyards. Now, that is clearly not enough. Look at China, on the other hand. They have been able to expand shipbuilding capacity at, a, at an amazing pace. So that is the second element, is shipbuilding capacity. The third thing, uh, you know, Indian Navy, as Admiral, as Commodore Ranjit Rai said, has maintained an unprecedented operational tempo over the years, despite all the constraints, budgetary constraints, material constraints, old ships, not enough ships, not enough submarines. But the kind of profile that the Indian Navy has maintained over the years is remarkable. But to sustain it, will the Navy will have to compromise somewhere. You know, it's like a rubber band. If you keep stretching a rubber band and keep it stretched, it either loses its elasticity or it will snap at some point. So if you want the Navy to do what it should do to maintain India's image as a major, major Indian Ocean power, as a major maritime power, you have to give it the wherewithal to be able to do that, to be able to project that power. That, unfortunately, I feel has not quite happened to the extent we would like. The Navy has done an amazing job. I mean, when you see the way the naval, the naval ships have been sailing in the last couple of years, it's unprecedented. And... You know, because of logistic agreements that we have, which Commodore I alluded to, we have been able to, uh, you know, keep them going. We've got logistic support in various places. But at the end of the day, it is your ability to protect your own maritime interests anywhere in the world and primarily in the Indian Ocean that will count. And I think that is important. From an underwater right. perspective, hmm. from an underwater perspective, yes. Uh, as I mentioned, we need to build up our submarine capacity, our submarine cap undersea warfare mm -hmm. capability. Across all dimensions, whether it's the helicopters, whether it's the PHIs, whether it's surface ships with advanced anti-submarine warfare equipment, all these things will be required to be able to maintain our primacy in the Indian Ocean. 
Absolutely. And uh, Commodore Ranjit Rai wants to say something. So, uh, sir, please go ahead. No, I just wanted to add on. Because AJ has given you the picture. You need money. Of course, I hope it comes through. Because I will talk of what we have lost. Four LPTs were supposed to be built. Five platforms of OPBs are lying in paper wow. Therefore, there has to be a level playing field. We have to go and take decisions. So two good things, if they happen, which Navy has been pressing for. We had training ships being built in ABT. And of course, we've got a little better acquisition program. But we need training ships. The base of our Navy is a long, wonderful training that AJ went through. And therefore, he is able to command three or four submarines. I went through from NDA, three years, midshipman, one year, cadet, one year, one year, something. And then I was on a ship for six months to get the watchkeeping ticket, which could even take one year if the captain said you're not fit. Because the day you get a watchkeeping ticket, you are the commanding officer of a ship of the size of Ikrant at night when the rest of the people are sleeping. We don't have the training ships. So these are the little things. But Navy is managing. They've converted your landing ship into a training ship. So I can admire what AJ said. It has not only maintained an operational profile, it has maintained its base of training ships. I come from the generation where the training people said, we want the Brahmutra class as training. People said, you're mad. They said, if you want the future generation, they should be able to see what is an FPI, FPS-5 gun. They should be able to see what is CPP propeller. They should be able to see the latest uh, uh, diesel engine. We, of course, came from a generation where, for us, in technology and internet has come easy. So the first week that you joined the Navy, they are talking of low-frequency sonar, mid-frequency sonar. They are talking of UHF. They are talking of UHF frequencies. So when the internet world has come into gigahertz, is easy. So he is absolutely right. We have. So now I come to my revolutionary thinking. Because in our old capacity, we did think for the Navy. And the generation that is today has been trained by people like AJ and possibly the, the very high generation um, were trained by people who have gone by. They, today, have an opportunity to export. If you give Larsen Tubro, which has sent OPVs to Vietnam, you give a subsidy, you've given ships to Sri Lanka, you're giving ships to Mauritius. Put yourself on the international market like the Brahmos has done. Who selected the Brahmos? The Indian Navy. But then Abdul Kalam Saab decided that it could be a tri-service weapon. So it is being exported. But who will support the Brahmos when it is given to a country? The Navy has the expertise. Navy brought it up. So I am very convinced we are in for very good times if our economy rises the way it should. And this other issues do not bog us down. Indian Navy will go into the export version. I just said the HAL has export has gone up. Private companies, Blasen, Tubro, others are exporting. But it has to be a level playing field, which the automobile industry and the pharmaceutical industry got. And therefore, I am looking at much better days because the Indian Navy has the capacity, the capability which AJ Singh has explained to you. But it has got to get the capability of shipyards, pushing the shipyards, and today's officers of generation are supervising ships, and they have supervised the Vikrant. It's a very, very complicated ship. But the design is getting proven. The radars on board, L-40 radar from uh, uh, Italy, it's got the Garpo, it's got uh, the uh, Barak, ADMR on it. A lot of technology, the satellite technology, and when we get the uh, Sikorsky uh, uh, MH20R helicopters, I mean, that will be a technological change, not only in the surface Navy, like the PHI, but underwater Navy, which will, of course, delight AJ Singh. Uh, so continuing from here, Commodore AJ, uh, uh, what is, uh, you know, we know that the Indian Navy has a very respectable position when it comes to navies of the world. And it is a part of a lot of alliances. So, uh, you know, the fact that there's a common uh, common country, China, and which has initiated the formation of these alliances world over, led by the Western fronts, 
So where where does it get us? How mm. where does it get the Indian Navy? And mm. uh, where do you see Indian Navy as a part of all these alliances mm. uh, in the let's say in the next ten uh, years or so? See, alignments and partnerships are going to be an important part of uh, of future uh, maritime operations. Yes, China because of its uh, sort of belligerence, maritime belligerence, and its challenging the existing rules based international order and wanting to reorient the free and open indo pacific into one with its own characteristics has alarmed the whole world mm. so besides the countries in the indo pacific even eurocentric countries like germany the netherlands uk france and now the overall the eu are articulating their own indo pacific strategies not so much from a military perspective but to ensure that the trade because you know 60% of global gdp is now being generated in the indo pacific and 60% of the global population resides here so for them it is a very important part of the world which they have to trade with uh, so that is why they are in, they are equally concerned about the safety of that trade and therefore it's important for them to ensure that we maintain a free and open indo pacific now the free and open uh this will require a sort of cohesive effort by many navies so that's why we have uh, you know uh, informal arrangements like the quad to quad in, in some way besides the quad which comprises four countries and doesn't look at only maritime security now that is something i'd like to emphasize unlike perception that it's a it's a china containment strategy yes unfortunately china's maritime belligerence has led it now the led the quad now to start looking at china very seriously if you remember till 2 years ago neither australia nor japan nor india ever mentioned china in any conversation related to the quad other than the us nobody else ever mentioned china but within the last 3 months ever since mm -hmm. the quad summit happened and china's belligerent all the three countries have started now naming china which means that china mm -hmm. is definitely an area of concern and if china feels bad about it i'm sorry to say but they brought it upon themselves uh with their with their sort of approach you know their their wolf their wolf warrior diplomacy their their uh, belligerence their uh, gray zone strategies etc 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 so india in the indo pacific will look at alignments and partnerships now i'm using the word alignments and partnerships are not alliance because india because of its strategic you know its its emphasis on strategic autonomy will never probably enter a formal alliance but it will have its bilateral and trilateral we have 2 plus 2 arrangements with individually with each of the quad countries we have these foundational agreements which are short of being an alliance but uh, imply quite the same thing but the only thing i am a little apprehensive about is in the indian ocean notwithstanding the support that we have and this this sort of alignments and partnerships that we form in the indo pacific we are forming them most of them with resident pacific powers not a single one of them is an indian ocean power so in the indian ocean it is going to be india which is pretty much going to have to ensure that it is able to uh, control the or shape the outcomes in the indian ocean most of the countries that we are having these alliance uh, alignments and partnerships in the indo pacific with do not presently have either the capacity or the capability to maintain a sustained uh, presence in the indian ocean neither south korean navy has it nor the japanese navy has it nor the australian navy has it perhaps the only one who has it to whatever extent is the us navy and the french navy which is more or less a resident indian ocean power and not so much an indo pacific uh, not so much a pacific navy so in the indian ocean india will have to pretty much uh, ensure that it is able to look after its own maritime interests and not hope that somebody will come to assist it directly yes what can happen perhaps is that after all the pla navy has to approach the indian indian ocean from the south china sea so it can so this so if these navies are able to keep it occupied or soften it up a bit it will make the task for the indian navy that much easier mm. uh, there is an arms race i wouldn't say an arms race but there is a naval uh, capability augmentation happening across the region and particularly in the undersea warfare domain i will not besides what's happening in the conventional submarine front with countries like philippines and even even sri lanka wanting to buy submarines or economically they may not be able to do so but what is even more interesting is the nuclear submarine element which is coming in with aukus coming in uh, australia is definitely going to have an ssn within the next 10 to 15 years if not earlier if if the americans or the brits are willing to lease it or submarine like india gets from russia all the better but even if they were to create their own capability within the next two decades they will have their own ssn operating in the indian ocean india is looking at 
having its own SSN fleet in the Indian Ocean, six of them. China will definitely be operating its SSN in the Indian Ocean. Pakistan is requesting China repeatedly to lease it one, in, one SSN like, like Russia has done for India. China hasn't done it so far, but tomorrow if China feels it's got its back to the wall in the region, it might just do it. So, and of course, you know, recently we saw two pretty unusual events. One is an American SSBN docking at Guam. Now, this is a very unusual thing for an American SSBN to do. By and large, SSBNs go out of their home ports and go back to their home ports so that their movements are not known. And around the same time, a Chinese SSBN was on surface in the Taiwan Straits. Now, this is also a pretty unusual development, even if it was heading back to its home port or wherever it was going. So what we are seeing is definitely an enhancement in the naval operational capability of navies. They're augmenting their capabilities. And in the moment, we are looking at an SSN-centric uh, maritime security undersea warfare dimension. Uh, it raises the entire, uh, you know, it, it sort of elevates the level of, of, of uh, tension in the region. Because the moment SSNs come in, it means even mm -hmm. open ocean uh, deployments are possible. They will be part of carrier battle groups. They, they can operate independently. They can shape the maritime battle space to advantage and even influence events on land because of the ability of their cruise missiles, like the Tomahawk or equivalent, which can fly 750 miles and even target uh, and even, even attack targets deep inside land. So, you know, this whole maritime equation is changing. We will see a lot more nuclear submarine presence in the Indian Ocean over the next, by 2030 onwards. And we must therefore be prepared with our own strategy to counter it along with our align, align with, with our partners and uh, to counter our adversaries. That's as far as the submarine element goes. Absolutely. That, that was absolutely perfect. And I think, you know, uh, gentlemen, both of you, uh, it's been wonderful speaking with you. And, uh, you know, as always, we feel that when we end a conversation with both of you, I think the audience, including the two of us sitting in front of you, Chatali and I, we really feel that we are enriched. And thank you so much. This was for the Republic Day. I'm sure the audience will be very happy to know that uh, yeah. things are very good. Yes, sir, please no, go ahead. Uh, very quickly, I'm yes, glad, sir. I'm great glad for the ending of this. AJ Singh has taken you to the international situation with yes. what is happening in Ukraine, what's happening between Russia and America, what is happening between there. Because Indian geopolitics, which Chaitali said is part of it, is a subject which is very difficult. But two things I must mention. I'm so happy that on this Republic Day, there is going to be a tableau of the Indian Navy explaining to you in 1946 that mutiny is not a good thing for a service to do mutiny. But they're realizing that mutiny in 1946 hastened the independence of India. So I must salute the thinking powers of the government of India not to get prejudiced, to be honest with what happened. And of course, is going to showcase Abhubali and the next Robin Hood, INS Vikrant. So with these, I think we should know, look forward to a budget, look forward to a, a responsibility which AJ Singh has told you. The subject today was only challenges, but basically challenges begin the responsibility. The whole world is looking at India to be the savior on this side as Pakistan, China try to do a power building exercise and the Indian Navy, with a huge water pass, is expected to do a lot, lot more. And I think the government is understanding it. That was the, just the perfect ending to the discussion. And thank you so much, Commodore AJ. Thank you so much, Commodore Ranjit Rai. Wonderful to have both of you at the show. And, uh, you know, I'm sure... Uh, next, in a few months, we again plan. I'm sure something or the other will keep happening and we'll keep disturbing you. So we are really going to, you know, it's going to enjoy this discussion. And uh, I think now Chetali is waiting for us. So we take you back to our studio at uh, Cyprus. Thank you so much, sirs. Jai Hind, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sangeeta. It's all Thank you so much, sirs. Obviously, it is not only interesting to hear from uh, both of you, the naval uh, Wikipedias of ADU, I mean, it was very interesting to listen to both of you, the challenges. And as said, yes, further we'll discuss about the responsibilities also someday. Thank you so much. And uh, Jai Hind, wish you a very great day ahead. Thank you so much, sir.
Thank you, Chatali. Wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.